Jeff, thank you so much um, for being with us today. It is so wonderful to be in your studio here in New York City as part of our Artist Conversation series for the Guggenheim Museum Mobile. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, Janine, it's great to have you here. Jeff, so I wanted to start off with one of your most iconic and beloved works, Puppy, from 1992, who um, is actually placed and living in front of our museum's entrance um, and open to all of our visitors. And so I wanted to ask you about uh, Puppy's origins, its history, its symbolism, mm -hmm. and um, how do you see the play between the animate and the inanimate? Mm -hmm. And how is that communal experience um, important in this work and in, in your overall practice? Uh, Jeanine, when I made Puppy, I wanted in one work really to uh, consolidate everything that I, I kind of picked up and experienced in the Baroque and the Rococo. And so I had spent a lot of time in Europe and visiting a lot of churches and uh, cathedrals. And what I always loved about the Baroque was it seemed to always be balancing different polarities. You would have the uh, the symmetrical with the asymmetrical. Or you would have aspects of the eternal in a, a spiritual form, very ephemeral, very ethereal. And at the same time, you would have the eternal through biology. Uh, you could have wood carvings of flowers and plants and animals and life thriving uh, through biology. And so uh, with Puppy, I wanted to bring all these polarities together to make uh, a work that was very much about control, giving up control, all of these different uh, kind of forces and of just life's energy and uh, this aspect of, uh, of, of life striving, you know, of, again, there, there are places that control is very important in our lives and there are places where there's no uh, place for it. And if you look at Puppy, certain plants are going to be thriving and shooting out 100 centimeters in one direction. Others are going to want to be moving out uh, more sideways. And so you have all these uh, forces taking place uh, within the piece. Puppy is uh, created in the form of um, a very particular dog, the West Highland Terrier. And it stands tall at 12 meters. And I believe it has roughly 38,000 um, different types of flowers. Um, can you tell us about how you began uh, with this vision and the first, I guess, iteration of Puppy um, when you showed it in Germany and then uh, how it came uh, to go out. I have a history of working with ready-mades. I love uh, ready-made objects. And what I love about the dialogue with the ready-made, it's a, a way to communicate not only to ourselves, but to other people that uh, our pasts are perfect. They can't be anything other than what they are. And everything's really about this moment forward. And by working with ready-mades, it can practice uh, the removal of judgment and acceptance. And so a uh, puppy is really a, a symbol of, of this type of uh, acceptance. Uh, it's completely uh, uh, organic. Uh, it's uh, and this contrast of life's energy against our kind of abstract, controlled uh, creation of objects. You know, objects are very strong. They're very, very durable and they can uh, outlive life as far as their presence of being. So th this type of uh, uh, contrast is present. But in the initial idea of the piece, I really just wanted to celebrate the, the history of uh, working with uh, plants, a kind of a, a topiary history, and uh, to make something that was performing in a spiritual manner uh, equivalent to uh, a, a church, a cathedral, something that people could gather around and have a discussion about, uh, I guess, transcendence, uh, our ability to transcend our circumstances and to participate in becoming. 
Pivoting now, Jeff, to another uh, award that is our, in, in our collection, Tulips, um, from 1994 to 2004. And it's one of your uh, pieces that is part of your uh, celebration series. Mm -hmm. And um, I recall that um, it's a piece that specially highlights um, uh, your experimentation with processes and materiality. And so I wanted to ask you, how, how did you uh, conceive the piece? Uh, why choose the tulip as your main flower? What's the significance of that? Um, and, and the idea of reflection, uh, in particular to the use of the material that you're um, incorporating or employing for this um, particular piece. You know, I was always attracted to inflatables and uh, the reason is for their anthropomorphic uh, qualities. Uh, you know, we are inflatables. When we take, you know, a deep breath and we inhale, we really have life's energy there. And uh, then when we exhale, you know, that's really like the symbol of our last breath. And uh, the membrane of a balloon is also uh, similar to our skin. And there's this dialogue of the inside and the outside. And that's really life experience. So if I look at the tulips, uh, immediately I'll think about John Dewey. And I'll think philosophically about what's really kind of the definition of life, how we look at life experience. John Dewey would say that uh, life is just a, a, an organism, really like a single-celled organism, uh, being affected by its environment. And then in return, the type of effect that that single cell organism would have uh, on its environment. And that this back and forth, this communication is life. That's the kind of animated aspect uh, of life. In making the uh, celebration tulips, I wanted to make something that was based in a sense of optimism and that uh, it would reference like a rainbow. It would represent uh, hope and at time a sense of, of celebration and to have this dialogue about materialism, about the strength of objects, the strength of durability. What, what really is durable? Is durable being able to be adaptable as a human being, to be very flexible within our own lives that we can adjust to different situation? Or is durability like stainless steel, this very you know, hard material? Uh, one of the reasons that I've always worked with stainless steel, I think of it as proletarian, that it's, uh, they're very visually luxurious pieces, visually uh, luxurious, but uh, as far as a material, they're not. I mean, stainless steel, it's what uh, pots and pans are made out of, yes. and in the end, we could melt it down and we could make spoons to eat off of, you know. So it, it has that communication, but at the same time, to present visual abstraction, uh, you know, uh, I, I think a, a beauty that is, uses light, the transcending uh, power of light. When I look at tulips um, every time that I am in Nobel, I, I am absorbed by uh, the colors that are reflecting upon each other. And upon that reflection, not only am I seeing myself, uh, in your work, I become part of your work, uh, but I'm also seeing newly invented colors because of the multiple layers of that reflection of color upon color. How do you, and I see that as, again, this communal experience, this transformative experience that um, you have mentioned in your, in your pieces, Is that, was that something intentional um, that you foresaw in, in making this piece? Absolutely. I mean, the idea of the inner reflectivity and that, uh, you know, a bulb that would be orange reflecting into a green uh, 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 tulip stem and bulb and, you know, the red into the yellow, all these inner reflections of color. And it, everything is dependent on the viewer. So when the viewer walks around the pieces, everything changes. And it's communicating to the viewer that where the art is happening is inside you. It has nothing to do with this external object. It's just kind of like a transponder of some type of 
trying to communicate uh, excitement, stimulation, but the art is when the viewer has an essence of their own potential, their own interests, their excitement, really about becoming. It's an, an essence of our possibilities. Uh, that's really the art. Jeff, now focusing on another uh, work uh, of yours, Plato, um, you know, the way that you take uh, the play on the materiality of a piece, uh, in particular with, with this work, uh, you know, when we see it, we think, oh, is this actually that material that I used to play with when I was a child? And a lot of your work really uh, are memorials to our childhood and really evoke wonder. Could you talk a little bit about how uh, you conceived Plato and uh, its significance with the passages of time? You know, it's interesting when we, we look back at our, you know, our childhood, our uh, interactions with uh, materials, and I think Play-Doh is a material that uh, most of us have experienced and have uh, uh, played with. And I'm using that material also to communicate uh, acceptance. And so um, every mound of Play-Doh is kind of perfect in its own being. I made a mound of Play-Doh and it happened to take that configuration, that shape and uh, the colors but uh, that doesn't mean that any other mound that was being made would be any less kind of perfect in its own uh, being. So it's to really communicate uh, acceptance and to embrace also memory. When we were younger, uh, we accept everything as children. We're open to everything, you know. The sky is blue and blue. It's the most beautiful color. Or if you lay down in the grass, you can smell the grass and. The, you know, it's so green and so wonderful. We're open to everything. But at a certain point, we start to believe and participate in hierarchies. And before we know it, we start to segregate. And, you know, we, uh, we are disempowering ourselves by, you know, creating this type of anxiety through judgment. And if we just accept everything and can see everything perfect in its own being, now, that doesn't mean that at different moments we may not find something more interesting. It could be more significant to us right at that moment. But it doesn't mean at another uh, time that uh, this other image or object or uh, may not become the most significant thing right at that moment for us. So I really believe that's how we walk out of Plato's cave. It's through acceptance and the removal of judgment. So it's playful within that, but it embraces, uh, it embraces memory, it embraces our past. You know, we have biological memory. It's, you know, we have our conscious memory, but we also have uh, this memory of, through our, in our organisms of really what it means to be human from the first experience that uh, we can go back of a single cell organism up through. And we can connect to that, uh, that history, and we do connect to that history. When we focus on our interests and, and really focus on them, it always leads us to a universal vocabulary. And that universal vocabulary is on the fringes of this biological memory. Jeff, I wanted to um, move towards uh, your piece, Seated Ballerina, from 2017, uh, and how uh, that was on view in New York City's Rockefeller Center. And it is a piece that stands 45 feet tall, and it is of a seated ballerina uh, lacing her ballet shoes, a uh, very elegantly, very posed, um, very monumental, uh, and not only in her scale, but also in her persona. And you said that uh, you're alluding at this piece to the uh, mythical goddess Venus, who embraces love, beauty, fertility, and so I was wondering uh, how, uh, can, if you can talk a little bit about that piece, uh, why uh, the persona of a ballerina, uh, how are you merging, fusing uh, ancient and modern art together? Uh, and again, this idea of reflectivity uh, that we can kind of see also in this piece. 
for the kind of the whole story on the ballerina, I would have to start back when I was a child. I was three, four years old, and I would visit my grandparents, my mother's uh, parents. They had an ashtray in their den, and this ashtray was a woman lying down on kind of a, a chaise, and uh, her legs were up in the air, and she had a fan on her chest, and at, uh, above, underneath her uh, legs was a place that you would put a cigarette. It was an ashtray. And supposedly from the heat of the cigarette and the smoke, it would make her legs move back and forth. Now, I would always use my finger and I would move her legs back and forth and the awe and wonderment that I had, the excitement from this piece, little porcelain uh, made after uh, the war, is really equivalent to maybe what I would have today, being excited looking at the Pieta or looking at a Bernini piece. And it's no different. What is important is that excitement. It's not what sprung that excitement. Of course, it's great to have these uh, things there that can uh, make that excitement, but still, it's that, that the individual can have that. So there's no difference uh, between the two. So my interest in uh, ceramics and porcelains, I started collecting different uh, figurines, and I've been putting them in my work since back in the, uh, the 70s. But I became very interested in ballerinas and for their symbols of fertility and the, you know, the communication coming out of the idea of Venus, and some of them represent the rites of spring. But more importantly for me, it would be that the art is the essence of our own potential. And somebody looking at it, you know, some people would like to be a dancer. And you look at a work of art, you could look at a Van Gogh painting, and uh, I can do that step. I can spin, and I can turn, and you know, in, within their own mind, they're making this choreography. That's the relevance of that artwork, that that viewer can have that type of essence of their potential. And so I think to have this large ballerina there and that reflective surface is, again, to open up the imagination of people that really what is art other than the essence of our own potential? Uh, you don't look at a, a Van Gogh or, and like, oh, oh, the, the, those tree branches are so beautiful. I want to be a tree branch. <laughs> or, you know, I just, uh, I have to make a tree branch. No, you look at that and you feel the excitement. You can feel feelings, biological feelings, of defining how we feel uh, within our own skins, but you feel ideas, you feel sensation. And, uh, and it, so it's about our potential. What, what type of vastness we can create for ourselves. That's the value of art. Wonderful, Jeff. Thank you so much for your time, for being with us today on this beautiful day in New York City in your studio. We are so thankful uh, for you taking the time to talk with us today. Thank you. Jimmy, thank you.